Time now for the Sunday Roundtable. And joining us this morning are Democratic political analyst Marianne Marsh and making her OTR debut, Republican political analyst Lizzie Guyton. We should have a drum roll or something. I know. I would love that. <laughs> Great to have you with us. Well, uh, Lizzie, let's start with you. We, 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 we just had Diana DiZoglio here. Our, our guest, as I mentioned, next week is Anthony Amore, so you can balance week to week. But based on what you heard today, what, what are your takeaways? So Diana DiZaglio has been in the state legislature for almost 10 years, and she has a record to defend, a record of spending, and even most recently, a record of inaction where she's been part of the team that has been sitting on Governor Baker's tax bill and certain things that would give relief to families in Massachusetts. Um, and on the other side, you have Anthony Amore, who's got the endorsement of Governor Baker. He actually has some experience in this area and some pri in the private sector. And I think it would be really interesting to see her, you know, talk more about her defending some of her votes and some of her inaction during her legislative career and how that's going to reflect on her being, you know, the state's fiscal watchdog. Marianne, what's your read? So I think Diana DiZaglio, there's no question voters aren't in the mood to vote off ticket and split mm -hmm. their tickets this year. They're going to go right down the Democratic ballot. That's an advantage for Diana DiZaglio. She will win in November. She talked a lot about during, during the campaign about the bully pulpit that she would be afforded as auditor. Today, she finally started talking more about the programs and policies, and you guys really pushed her on it. I think the more she can talk about what she wants to do as auditor, the programs and policies, and how she will do it, the better served she will be in January when she takes office. Um, so Jeff Deal and Maura Healy, the top of the ticket, had their first televised face-to-face -face deb debate this past week. This Sunday uh, will be their last. Uh, I'm sorry, this Thursday will be their last. Uh, it's going to be here at WCVB. Do they need to sharpen their message, Marianne, and what's your advice to them? So Maura Healy treated the last debate and this one as like the final playoff game. Going into the championship in November 8th, she was animated, she had her points, she had her answers, she had her policies, she was on her game. And there's no question she's the next governor of Massachusetts. Jeff Deal, on the other hand, in a last debate, could be desperate and foul a lot during that debate. The fact is he's already out of the game because you look at the polls, he has no shot at winning. So what, was, what would you be your advice after watching? That debate. I think one of the biggest challenges for Jeff Deal is during his candidacy, he's been using the National Republican Playbook and not the Massachusetts Playbook that's proven to elect Republican governors to the corner office. Um, there's a host of issues out there right now that people are struggling with that a lot of Republicans have been able to capitalize on, whether it's sky high inflation, it's a uh, president with low approval ratings, mm -hmm. it's dysfunction in our own state legislature. Um, and he's not been able to get his hits down on some of those issues because he's been using a lot of national politics. And, you know, I might be too little too late, but I think that he would do best to sharpen his messaging on that and push more Healy also to have to appeal to not just Democratic voters, but voters that are more in the middle. We know that in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. you don't just get across with one party or the mm -hmm. other. So to Lizzie's point, she's spot on on this. But what you saw Deal do was, I am with Trump. I'm not with Trump. I'm trying to, you know, straddle this fence and then tries to hit some of those other issues like crime, inflation and all the other things. Jeff Deal's trying to be everything to everybody. And it's way too late in this race to be something to anyone. All right. At, uh, for everybody at this table, raise your hand if you've gotten your check from the nearly $3 billion <laughs> refund. I don't see any hands going up. Did you get yours, Sarah? No, you didn't get yours either, right? Well, it, it, this is as promised under the 1986 law, but Democrats already filed a bill to limit high-income earners to a $6,500 refund, so whatever is left would, would, uh, would go to others. So will this fly uh, legally or politically, Marianne? Let me start. None of the above. And I said last week, it looked like the legislature just might do something to try to you change this and here we are with the biggest trial balloon you could ever see here's the fact this passed in 1986 i voted against it a lot of people did it doesn't matter it's the law and with our democracy hanging in the balance here obey the law but it's also undercutting question one where people have are saying the money's right. not going to go to education it's not right. going to go to transportation it's not right. going to go to infrastructure so they're hurting question one doing this e e one, one of the one of the commercials on the air for quest against question one is we've already got a surplus right Liz yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of money coming from different places right now on the state and federal level. But the facts are is, you know, this tax bill has been in front of the legislature for months and now they're in an informal session. If I'm a Republican running in a race, um, I would love for, you know, one of uh, my Democrat opponents to try to do something to make a money grab for that. I mean, people are hurting right now. They're hurting. They're really concerned going into this winter with astronomical increases to energy bills, with increased mm -hmm. cost of food mm -hmm. and getting some of that tax relief is a welcome thing and they should get it done. Speaking of surpluses, the state auditor also released a report this week saying the state shortchanged cities and towns by $1.2 billion this year through unf uh, unfunded mandates. This would pretty much eat up what's left of the surplus in the state right now. Is the state wandering into dangerous territory as Baker leaves office, Lizzie? 
I don't think so. The Baker administration has kept their commitment to cities and towns on local aid. They've done that since day one that Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito were voted into office. There's also a lot of different money coming in for schools from the federal uh, COVID funds. And our rainy day fund is the highest it's ever been in state history at $6.6 .6 billion. But is there a commitment to cities and towns to provide money when it's unfunded mandate? I think that some of these things need to be worked out. And, you know, a lot of these audits, there's devils in the details. But I think that there's a lot of money coming in and that if there's you know, any accounting that needs to be done, then that will need to be addressed. Marianne? Fund the mandates, give people money back in the 1986 law, and, you know, make sure that you've got other funds coming in and fix the, one, the unfunded mandates. You've got to do all three. It's not a mutually exclusive exercise, but now you've got a chance to save question one.